I'd like to uh, wrap up my uh, remarks about uh, self-creation, self-invention, and the challenge of the uh, uh, eternal recurrence by saying that, that uh, uh, we need to remember that this, has to do, uh, that this has to do with what I mentioned later in the lecture, the love of fate. Loving the place you found yourself in history, and sometimes that's a difficult thing to do, and for me, that's a quite personal remark that has to do with my own self-invention, is to try to love the place I found myself in history. Like many other people now, is, uh, I, I find that difficult. Uh, Nietzsche, on the other hand, uh, thought it might be difficult, but it was a challenge that we should attempt to meet. Uh, in this uh, uh, next set of remarks, I'd like to address uh, the will to power, and of course, that gives me a chance to uh, address something that uh, I probably should have talked about in the opening lecture because in a set of uh, lectures on Nietzsche uh, that in which we want to reach a, a, an audience, a, a very wide audience, we need to dispel some of the myths about Nietzsche's text and concerning Nietzsche. And one of the most prevalent and certainly uh, uh, it's a widespread myth, you can, you can find it in many places. Uh, is the myth uh, of the connection, well, I, I want to first say it's a myth and then I want to argue the, the danger and risk in Nietzsche's text that, because I use myth in a strong sense, that allows it to be possible. I want to discuss for just a moment the relation of Nietzsche's work to fascism. And the reason I want to do that is because the, the first sort of Americanized reception of Nietzsche involved the use of Nietzsche's text for propaganda purposes by various National Socialist Party hacks. Unfortunately, it belongs to the nature of propaganda even by the good guys who do counter-propaganda, as if we knew who good guys were after all the events that occur. I mean, this, is, this isn't going to turn out to be a, a, you know, a, a defense of the fascists or anything. It's not. Uh, it, I hope it doesn't turn out to be a defense of any parties. You know? I wish them all equal luck. In the words of Nietzsche, whatever is shaky should be pushed over. Something is shaky, on a shaky foundation, his advice is to push it over. You know, if, it's, if it's not on a shaky foundation, then when you push, it'll stay there, it'll be okay. But if it's on a shaky foundation, push it over. In any case, uh, uh, the counter-propaganda uh, also involved Nietzsche and, 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 and the British uh, in their uh, efforts to combat uh, Nazi propaganda uh, also pr participated in, just like uh, the Nazis were valorizing certain remarks of Nietzsche's, uh, then the British were at the same time demonizing those remarks, and that couldn't help but affect the reception of his work in England. And since in the United States, as I may have earlier remarked, we're so in love with British intellectuals, we know they couldn't be wrong about anything just because of their damn accent. You just use that accent and American academics begin to swoon. And, you know, they go into, into you know, almost orgasmic uh, reactions to what's being said. Uh, uh, we knew that this British reception of Nietzsche must mean that, that he's, you know, like the philosopher of fascism. Well, there are, there are elements in Nietzsche's text that open up onto the risk of a hideous new project. <coughs> in which against a technological world, we re try to reinvigorate it through blood, steel, and a new human being, the famous overman, which I will discuss when I discuss the text of Zarathustra. That such a sort of clever interpretation could then be used for propaganda purposes is clear. It was. It's clear that it could be used that way. Uh, I don't think, uh, to be fair to the text of Nietzsche, that this use is one that can in any sense be authorized under older, fairer standards of interpretation. However, I should say that those are the very standards Nietzsche himself attacked, older, fairer standards of interpretation. But by those hermeneutic standards of interpretation, the older, fairer ones, it would be fair to point out that Nietzsche always viewed himself as a good European rather than a good German. He, skeeped, he just skeeped. He just laid tons upon tons of abuse upon those narrow nationalists who 
were good Germans and always talked about the Teutonic forests. Once Nietzsche said, well, back to the forest with them then. You know, you know, they're, they're, they're just boring the hell out of me. I hope they go live in the forest. They're that sort of the way I feel about a lot of the rhetoric in the United States on the right today is, oh, it's so good, we'll just go live in the you know, big go from coast to co shining coast and Bangor to shining Maine or whatever the hell you want to do. But uh, now Nietzsche just scorned this, uh, this German nationalism. It's, har it's hard to imagine that someone so sensitive that the event that finally, uh, as it were, tripped Nietzsche off into madness, another topic that we'll talk about in the lectures that remain, the event that finally tripped him into madness was someone beating a horse with a whip. Someone that sensitive, was that sensitive a nature in a certain way, it's hard to imagine uh, would have done well had he lived long enough as a great propagandist for that gang of petty bourgeois thugs that took over Germany and became the Nazi party. So I think that that was a, a, a dangerous uh, misunderstanding of the text of Nietzsche. However, and this is the admission that I think is necessary to, to show the risk of the text, however, once you've introduced processes of radical self-creation and redirection, <coughs> left them wide open, and then argued for the strongest possible misinterpretations you know, the ones that are the most creative, interesting, and new, clearly you've opened yourself up to the possibilities of violence, death, madness, and many other things as well. So that's the admission on the one hand, not that it needs to be admitted. I mean, we live in the 20th century, one of the most barbaric, or perhaps the most barbaric century in the history of the world. I mean, if there was a central fact to our century, it would be murder, killing of people by their people. So, uh, to take before the bar this one rather literate, cosmopolitan, quiet little man who wrote these rather exciting texts as some causative factor in that much larger process, I think is, uh, is overkill of a very high order. In any case, uh, his text does open onto the danger of fascism, but as I said, that for me is not an objection because dangerous and insane risks are taken in his text in other directions as well. And that many texts have risks, many interesting texts, many interesting bodies of work have, have risks and many uses. Uh, the, uh, the standard though Americanized pop line that Nietzsche was for the German Superman in Blonde Beast is just simple minded. And so that's not a criticism, it's just, it d doesn't mean that there aren't lines in his work that are like that, but it's simple minded. And, and that should be enough to, to move slightly past that. Uh, it's a simple-minded way to look at Nietzsche, far too simple-minded. Uh, and, and, and that's not, as I say, to, to get out of the, uh, the trap that Nietzsche's uh, text is full of risks. Uh, however, an odd thing has happened in, in the return of Nietzsche in our own time is that while at one time, uh, uh, he was uh, used for ideological purposes uh, in the uh, National Socialist and the Movement of Fascism. Uh, according to Bloom and other paleoconservatives of the current period, the return of Nietzsche in the 60s and then what I might call his re-return in the 80s and 90s has been scandalously anarchistic left-wing Nietzsche. So obviously this is a text that can produce many differential political effects because the Nietzsche denounced by Bloom is the person who argues for strong multiple interpretations, for recreating, you know, canons and destroying older canons of knowledge. The Nietzsche that said that if things are shaky, push them over, that Nietzsche. So, uh, you know, it's hard, to, it's hard if one wants to place simple moral blame upon a body of text to go, well, uh, Nietzsche was responsible for fascism, and damn it, now he's responsible for its opposite number, anarchism. Why wasn't he just a damn good liberal like John Stuart Mill? Well, he thought Mill was a blockhead, you know? I mean, uh, why wasn't he just a middle of the roader? I mean, you know, that's the politics that seems to dominate the current period, sort of middle of the roader, mainstream. Well, to quote my friend Hightower from Texas, there's nothing in the middle of the road where I come from except yellow lines and squashed armadillos. 
And so uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad that Nietzsche's text isn't in the middle of the road, and it does allow for multiple political uses, and some of those I want to talk about now in terms of the will to power. Uh, and I'm going to have to return to, in order to do that to my discussions of uh, genealogies. Before I do, I want to leave one more note on Jesse Jackson in the lecture. I mean, I'm not his campaign manager, it's just an interesting example. But uh, I have been asked, uh, you know, well, if he has, you know, this real courage of self-creation, why doesn't he, like, run for a real job like mayor? That would show real courage. Well, my view of that, and, and I don't know if it was Nietzsche's, and I don't care, my view of that is it doesn't take real courage to be a mayor, a governor, a senator, a president, real courage to be the head of a bureaucracy, real courage to be the president of IBM, but it does take real courage, as you know if you live in the Washington, D.C. area, to sleep under the bridges at night. It takes a lot more courage. So I'm not sure that running for mayor is something that we should particularly valorize as an act of courage. I mean, in a certain way, it takes far more courage to be a pimp than a politician even though in many other respects the jobs are similar. <laughs> okay, enough, uh, uh, enough of that for now. We'll return to that later. The will to power. Well, first let me say that the will to power is the name of a text by, uh, of Nietzsche. I shouldn't say by Nietzsche, because the will to power was pieced together in a way that makes us suspect the text itself by his sister, and I've already, you know, denounced his sister somewhat for dressing him up, for marrying one of these good Germans, and for the uses she made of her brother's persona after he lost his mind. Well, she was one of the editors that helped compile these fragments of the will to power. Since then, however, Kaufman and others have worked upon this compilation, but by now it's almost useless to go back and pretend there's no such text because as in the case of a much shorter text, namely the fragment I discussed, which was I Have Forgotten My Umbrella, which has now become a text of Nietzsche's by, through this radical process of interpretation, so now too is the will to power a much larger, more complex text become a text of Nietzsche's, even though he never compiled it in that way or put it together in that way. The will to power is, uh, in fact, I... I'm not sorry that it did, because the will to power contains a, a host of suggestive, fascinating, and interesting views, uh, among which is, is Nietzsche's famous view of power that I will be discussing. Uh, it's impossible to discuss it, however, without connecting it in some way to the, genealogy, the, the, the process of genealogy that we discussed when we talked about the genealogy of morals. Because one of the things that genealogy was supposed to do is to show us that, as it were, what shapes discursive practices and actual human practices are certain relations of power which create the conditions for the possibility of certain sentences being written and certain practices being carried out, then calls for an account of what those relations of power or like. And in the will to power, Nietzsche gives us an account of force, as it were, or power, that is uh, very interesting. For Nietzsche, power won't be the simple power of domination of one self over another, and the reason it can't be that linear self over another self kind of power is because, as you may have guessed already, for Nietzsche, as for Hume, in a certain way, there is no essential self. There are only, as it were, a kind of multitude of personas that, when a life is well lived, will have the coherence of a character. In fact, isn't that what we say about someone we know who's rather advanced in years and we want to valorize them? We say, God, oh, Bob, or Aunt Sue was really a character. When you say that, you've said something Nietzschean about them. They've put together those various selves in a way that makes them really a character, and that's not a bad thing to say. Well, anyway, the reason that these, that for Nietzsche, power can't be simply the power of one person over another, it can't be that simple, is because selves aren't that simple. 
and also because power is not just, as it were, horizontally applied in models that we might think of like the Marxist theory of exploitation or other theories of power. How power isn't just applied, as it were, across the horizon of the social body. By that, I mean, by that rather wild phrase, I mean it's not as though power is applied merely to the external manifestations that break the rules of the current existing order. Power is also applied that were vertically across the intensity and in within the subjectivities of people. One way of putting this is that in some sense we internalize relations of power within ourselves that allow many of the external relations to function. Now to give a West Texas example of that is that each one of us has to have a little cop inside us, a little tiny policeman inside that keeps us from stealing because there aren't enough cops on the outside to keep us from doing it. And yet there are many things we want that we don't have the money for. And under conditions where we carry out our will and valorize ourselves, we might otherwise take them. And given the rate at which people who steal things are caught, which means much less frequently than you'll be caught at work trying to take a long break, it kind of makes it rational to want to steal certain things, but it's easier to do than get by with than getting by with laying off work for a while. Uh, under those conditions, it becomes clear that power also is, in a sense, an intensity within, something that you bring against yourself and, a, and against your own self-project in a way that's been characterized by certain French theorists as micrological power or sets and effects of power rather than macrological power. So if I talk to you about the police or the state or the, even in Marx's sense of the power of the marketplace, these are macrological views of power and Nietzsche provides us with a micrological view. And, and that micrological view has to do with tiny intersees of overlapping effects, very difficult to characterize, very subtle effects of power, almost unnoticeable. In fact, they sometimes pass not for power at all. This is what a genealogical analysis is supposed to show. Sometimes they don't pass for relations of power at all, but rather for things like a good conscience clear mind, or fair rules, or even fairness itself. Uh, those discourses, as self-evident as they may seem to us today, are also structured by power. And I think that to make Nietzsche's analysis of power come alive for us now, rather than uh, uh, a sort of long uh, account of it, I'll give a little bit more of the sort of theoretical complexity of it, then I'll give a real example to give it real bite, okay? So let me give a little more of the theoretical uh, version of it. For Nietzsche, power is, not, uh, is always in some sense relational. It's not as though power is a thing that we can find in the world, but it is always a complex relational set of intervening and interacting effects. It's not always the best question to ask what are the causes. In some cases, it might even be, although it sounds oxymoronic, it might be best to say uh, quasi-metaphorically, or maybe metaphorically, that, that power sometimes gives off effects where, where we have in what it amounts to an absent cause. In other words, what the analysis really should look at are the effects and bracket out what might, what might otherwise in a normal analysis be called the cause. Instead, these multiple effects, these relational effects, and to use some more terminology, which isn't French, it's modern American lit crit terminology, these overlapping economies of power, of influence, of persuasion, of control, these micrological ones are not subject, to, as I say, to simple linear analysis in any one of the various modes that we might be used to it, you know, analyses of uh, us in particular, ordinary analyses of political power. These can, uh, so uh, let me see if I can cash this in with a, a, what I think is a very interesting example, and at least I hope it's a good example. And uh, it should lead to the next 
uh, thing I want to discuss, which is Nietzsche's view of history. Uh, I'm going now to refer to uh, Michel Foucault's uh, brilliant work, Discipline and Punish. And uh, if you haven't read it, uh, please read it, because it is a strange artifact, and it would not be possible without the influence of Nietzsche. And to discuss Foucault's Discipline and Punish will have us enter the terrain of the politics of reading Nietzsche, which I want to get onto now, which, as I said, might be a banal topic, but it's one I enjoy, so what the hell, I'm going to talk about it some. But Michel Foucault is uh, someone who's made great and systematic use of parts of Nietzsche, the genealogical method and Nietzsche's sensitivity to these micrological relations of power. Now, for me, the best work by Foucault, as I said, is Discipline and Punish. And in that book, uh, what Foucault is interested in is to do a genealogy of the forms of punishment and how they changed if they did change, and in what ways they changed between this period I have characterized as feudal to this period that I have characterized as modern. So Foucault starts his book with older forms of discipline and punishment. In fact, uh, the first uh, section is on the spectacle of the scaffold, and it begins with uh, as gory a description as one could wish of an execution in France. Huge audience. Bring out this guy. I'm just going to gloss it. I don't want to read all that stuff. It'd turn this damn thing into a horror movie. But anyway, you have this huge audience for this execution. You bring out the guy. He's drawn, quartered, molten lead poured into here. Horses pull on him. The crowd is in an uproar, scream, and is tortured by the pull, pull, pull. Finally, they drag him up, and a prelate of the church comes up. The man still can speak, you know, and he confesses that he's done wrong and courageously states that now he's paying his price, his honor to God. And then they burn him you know, after using sulfur and so on. Well, you read this section in Foucault and you recoil in horror from those old feudal relations and how barbaric they were. And Foucault does his best to make it come alive for you, the conditions of possibility for those practices. The arbitrary rule of kings, you know, the necessity to, pro to give the crowd its spectacle, it's festivals of atonement. And it, it, it's important that the criminal there, you know, atone in a rather spectacular public way for his crime. Well, toward the end of this long and rather barbaric uh, chapter in feudalism, which uh, in this sort of feudal setting, uh, Foucault begins to mention how the spectacle of the scaffold begins to die away under a rather strange condition of reversal. I hope this will make Nietzsche's genealogical idea clearer, too, as I use the Foucault example. The spectacle of the scaffold begins to die away. And one of the reasons that Foucault suggests for this is that who turns out to be the hero of the spectacle? The legislator or prince who condemned the man? The prelate who forgave him? Or the suffering wounded, courageous body of the victim. Imagine the crowds, you know, and who they will eventually begin to pull for, as it were. Well, the insinuation by Foucault is this form of exercising power across the social body begins to undermine itself through a strange reversal where the, uh, the victim being slaughtered becomes, as it were, the center, the important focal point of the ceremony and begins to win the sympathy of the crowd. And of course, that's not the idea of discipline and punishing in that period or in this one. It's hardly the idea, right, for the punished party to be the star of the show. Now you may say, well, we've, we've gone back to that in a way because we do all, there's one sure way to get a mini-series and that's to be a serial killer. That's true under conditions that I will describe before the end of this lecture as postmodern. 
but right now we're going from feudal to modern. Under postmodern conditions, things have grown so bizarre that I'm not sure how, my, uh, how I will use Nietzsche to help analyze them. But in any case, now I want to go from this feudal spectacle of the scaffold to, moder to the modern uh, methods of discipline and punish. The horror ev sort of evoked in us by what Foucault does there is the horror simply at a past form of life and the way they punished people. Now, of course, what happens after that are there are these great prison reforms in the 18th and 19th century. Utilitarians, for example, like Bentham, were very involved in prison reform. And in ending this scaffold business and these public spectacles, no, they wanted clean, I mean, they, they had programs like Bush's clean new prisons that were sort of humane, but enough of them. So Bentham, and, and Foucault makes brilliant use of this. Bentham, the great utilitarian, interestingly enough, also came up with a, a great architectural design called the Panopticon. And it was a building where from the sort of top of the building, I wish I had a drawing of it here for you, but from the top of the building, you can kind of see everything that goes on down through it. And each one of the cells facing in on them, where the prisoners are, have the peculiar characteristic that you're isolated so that you cannot you know, see the other people. But as the guards walk through in surveillance, they can see you quite easily. And this was very important for the device itself. This is the surveillance aspect of modern power. And this is quite micrological. To give you an ordinary example of how modern power works in that way, you may be a perfectly honest citizen, a straightforward person, but when you walk into a department store, frequently you're being filmed and watched. And it's so ordinary, so micrological, so beneath the surface of your consciousness and everyday effects that you don't think about it, but you're being filmed and watched and surveilled as you walk through the mall, or as you walk through a department store, or as you drive through the city the sort of omnipresent helicopter that <laughs> is not a paranoid delusion. You see them all the time. It's just that you forget because of their ubiquity. The power is like that. It's sort of ubiquitously running here and there. It becomes easy to forget what structures our own power. It becomes easy to remember about the past, how barbaric it was, and sort of distance ourselves from it. Well, anyway, Bentham's Panopticon was, as Foucault argues, a principle and not merely a building. The general principle of surveillance. And it's been crucially important for the shift to new forms of discipline and new forms of punishment. Bentham brilliantly uh, shows that it's no mere building by arguing, oh, by the way, this same design for this panopticon building would be absolutely appropriate for schools, workhouses, and many other socially utilizable, you know, socially utilitarian benefits. I mean, schools could be built this way, right, so that all the students are working and you can see them and they can't see you easily, and, and so the principal could be at the top and looking down upon this thing. And Bentham thought, well, what a wonderful device, this panopticon, this sort of one-way visual presentation of all the surveilled people. Again, to return to my example, you never get to see the face, do you? of the person behind the one-way glass in Macy's who's doing the filming of you as you walk up and down the aisle? Uh, hell, who even notices anymore, right? You don't even notice it, hell. I mean, sh shouldn't it be outrageous, you know, to, to sort of this earlier generation of Americans? What the hell are you doing filming me? I don't steal. I'm an honest, you know, God-fearing, tax-paying American. I don't want to be on your damn film, surveilled, watched, filed, numbered. I don't want that. The ubiquity of this kind of surveillance is just obvious. Uh, also, you know, in, 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 uh, we've now found out that the telephone is you know, quite a strange instrument to pick up, since God knows who's listening and recording what you're saying. Uh, and now the possibility for multiple interpretations reinstitutes itself at a much higher level, because you may in fact say on the phone, I have forgotten my umbrella. It might click off some strange computer by some strange government agency saying, ah, oh, this person's one of those weird interpreters of Nietzsche. And you may only be telling your Aunt Susan that you forgot your umbrella. 
and that you'll already be in a huge bank of information pre-interpreted in some basement in the city where they are going over it, providing analyses, the companies and the agencies that provide the analyses and so on. Power micrological like this very well may be beneath the level of everyday life. By that I mean in everyday life we may just walk past it. I mean, I know I, know I do for sure in a department store. I don't, well, sometimes I stop and wave at the little guy. And sometimes when I hear a click on the phone, I stop and go, oh, I'm sorry you have this job of listening to all these boring. You know, you know have you ever commiserated with a surveiller? It's going, oh, I'm so sorry you don't have anything to do but to listen and open my mail and listen to all these phone calls. And if you ever get lonely, please call and let's talk. <laughs> this is a nice strategy to adopt. But anyway, uh, the power of Foucault's argument is supposed to be to show that what has happened is not that we've gone from one thing that appears to us to our sensitive liberal utilitarian instincts as barbaric to something less barbaric, but to a new mode of discipline and punishment and surveillance, which is itself an incredible effect of the expansion of power, not of its contraction, across many areas of life. Across many areas of life. The, spe the, the sort of spectacle of the scaffold is over. But we still execute people. We just do it behind wall after wall of secrecy. You know, wall after wall of secrecy. They're still executed, but it happens in a space where we, in principle, can't look. Now, I know that people have run for, say, the governor of Texas and argued that we should put these things on TV, you know, Hell, if we're going to execute them, show it on TV. And, uh, you know, it, it didn't work out as an idea, and he lost the election. Uh, I think if he had sold it to the networks first and then tried it as a political <laughs> idea, he would have had something. But he didn't try that. Well, the serious point being made by Foucault is not that that old barbaric power of the past has been broken and liberal democracy is won everywhere. No. It's that power has shifted, there are, it has expanded in its intensity, and precisely by becoming even more hidden, micrological, every day in a certain way, sort of seeping in every day, it has become, as it were, even more sort of totalizing, territorializing, if you like, more and more of our lives in subtle but profound ways. So uh, I guess that I wanted to use that example in particular because now uh, we, we begin to wonder about even Foucault's analysis if it isn't a bit old-fashioned and we're not in yet another space because Foucault is still, to my mind at least, somewhere on the borderline between a modern account of power and one that I would characterize as post-modern or after the modern. And it's going to be difficult for me to characterize that in spite of the title of these lectures, which is Nietzsche and the Postmodern Condition, because no one yet knows what the postmodern condition is, because it is not a condition we're in yet. It is a trajectory. As, as Nietzsche said of the death of God, it is perhaps an event on its way. Uh, I wanted to use Foucault's, uh, the example of Foucault, however, to try to show you what genealogies do how they reverse our perception. So in the case of the feudal period, they show us the reversal that occurs on the scaffold when all of a sudden the person you're tearing apart becomes the hero. And if that's not surprising through, you know, when you see through their courage and stamina they become the hero of that spectacle. The spectacle begins to disappear. We don't, that guy can't be the hero. Uh, well, similarly, the stories we tell ourselves about our institutions or sort of uh, now, our institutions under sort of modern liberal democratic societies, democratic societies, the stories we tell ourselves is that they are based on legitimacy, consensus, and so on. And Foucault's book warns us that that may be the discourse within which we discuss them, but what makes that discourse possible are the micrological powers of discipline, punishment, and surveillance that undergird that liberal discourse. 
And again, like uh, as in the case where Nietzsche quotes St. Thomas, one could hardly quote a better source than Bentham, who was a social engineer or a reformer uh, in the tradition of, you know, many others we've encountered since. Uh, and this panopticon device to show that a reversed look at this discourse of democracy and so on shows that beneath it are these micrological effects of power. And I would like to say about them that they are differential and highly complex. Uh, the, uh, and I mean, I don't know if the Foucault example is enough. Uh, one might have to do more still to make this come alive. Let me see if I can try another way to do this. Uh, well, let's take, for example, a situation where it seems as though the only force that's being recognized is the force of the better argument, namely a university setting. That's one I'm familiar with, so we'll, I'll take that as an example. Argument within that setting seems to proceed free of power. Knowledge seems to be produced in a way that is interest-free. That's the ideal of research in a way, interest-free knowledge, knowledge free of the effects of power. If Nietzsche is right about power, wherever there is knowledge, it will be an effect of power. That will not mean it's not knowledge, folks. In other words, understanding that knowledge is an effect of certain power won't mean that it isn't what is really knowledge. Yes, it will be. But it will be to see, as it were, the other side. It will be a, a reversal. It will be to see that that knowledge effect is itself an effect of certain relations of power. Now, in the case of the university, the institutional powers are quite subtle. In other words, it's very rare that, especially at a university, and this is more common in high school, where you can simply take unruly students and throw them out into the street. The university, you don't get that opportunity quite so often, that thrilling opportunity to just take a student you don't like, say, get the hell out of here, don't come back. But uh, there are other ways, and, and they may seem childish, but sometimes power is childish. There are other ways to discipline. One of my favorite is grading. And it starts very early in our lives. Our first system is highly complex and struct. If you want an account of structuralism, this is an interesting one. Uh, in, in kindergarten, uh, the way we sort of discipline our kids, they do, they, they do uh, their rows, and it's really red, and they stay in the lines, they get a happy face. If it gets a little out of the lines, they just get a sort of straight face. They really just draw all over the thing in chaotic Nietzschean wildness. They get a sad face, you know. If they don't turn in the work at all, they don't get a face. No face. And I noticed that as you go out throughout, throughout school, that this same top topography of, of discipline continues. In Elite universities, we still go I, and, and, and the fact that we've substituted a letter for that happy face doesn't mean the message is different. In other words, they've been socio, so, socialization. Power has already instructed them that that I is a happy face. And you get an I, and you see a happy face. I, happy face. B, and guess what you get? C. And if you, for God's sakes, in an elite university, if you flunk somebody, you won't see their face. You may get a letter from their attorney, but you won't see their face. Okay? My point here is that the structural disciplinary way that that's done, believe me, if you're grading in the humanities, the difference between a brilliant paper on Plato and one that's completely insane is not an easy distinction. If you think it is, you just you don't teach that. I mean, I admit that in math courses, you know, there we can let a sort of traditional view hold sway for a moment, but when you're grading a paper on Plato, for God's sakes, or Shakespeare or Proust, it's hard to know the difference between a brilliant insight and a piece of garbled lunacy. Uh, and this is exactly, to return to my political moment, this is exactly the problem we have when we listen to many of our current official leaders speak. So we don't know whether this is really a piece of powerful political rhetoric or a garbled line from a David Lynch film. 
You know, sometimes I expect to see one of the currently elected high executive officials just walk around going, in the land I come from, the birds sing a pretty song and stuff like that. You know, that weird David Lynch dialogue. We don't know. You know, it might even be an act of political genius for at least one person I have in mind here to do something like that. So free him of his image, whatever. In any case, what I'm after here is a topography of very subtle power. Because it looks as though my power to give that grade is my power. But what happens if I decide I'm not going to play that game anymore and I'm going to just give all my students A's that complete the work and otherwise F's? I'm not going to do this gradation, this topography anymore. I can't. I've tested that one empirically. They won't let me do it. No, you have to have a spread. Now, here's the interesting thing about power today. They don't tell you what the spread is exactly because micrologically, they're disappointed that you haven't been, as it were, already conditioned to know that. So they're sort of disappointed in you that you didn't realize all along that you needed that spread. Just like if you opened a Macy's that you happen to be the manager of and didn't get that camera installed. Your supervisor would go, well, I thought you knew we always use cameras. You know, you were a pretty nice fella, but we always use them. We don't want to interfere with our customers, no. But we always use these cameras. It's for the good of the rest of the customers. Because if there's a lot of shoplifting, the prices will go up. Of course, that'll be an act of God. No human will actually raise them. That's economics. No humans do it. They're, sort of acts of, they're the only things left that probably are acts of a dying God. Economic acts. But anyway, uh, uh, these forms of power that Nietzsche sets our sights on in the book, The Will to Power, shows, shows power in quite a different light than normal political theory because these, these are situations within which power and knowledge and principle are intermingled. For example, when I, when I earlier said there was, you know, paradoxically, Nietzsche argues there's an immoral origin to morality. Paradoxically, there is a rational knowledge itself has its origins and relations of power, which themselves, in my view, cannot be rationally defended. That that is their origin does not mean that what they produce, again, to make this point again so you don't take a simple-minded mistake out of here, that doesn't mean it isn't real knowledge. The universities and, and many other things, research institutes and all, produce real knowledge, what we today call knowledge anyway. I call it information. I'll return to that later. I'm, I don't, I don't, I don't want to call it knowledge. I want to call it information. But the conditions under they produce it are these subtle conditions of power. Grading is, is one example. Grading is just one example. It's one of my favorites, though, because it's one of the times in life when you see what a, a, an incredible effect you can have by making a happy face. You can make someone happy by just... Now, someone's, someone's bound to say, well, of course you do because those grades depend upon what they do later in life and their jobs. Well, that just feeds back into my earlier argument, of course, because the rest of your whole stinking life, you're going to be looking for a happy face from someone, you know, eight years in the law firm, and you're looking at all the old lawyers that forgot all the law they ever knew 20 years ago, and you're waiting for one of those S-O-Ws or whatever to give you another happy face. Well, the challenge of Nietzsche, the sort of left Nietzsche that I want to evoke, is to at least be aware of these intercedes of power, to at least be aware of them, and to be willing to challenge their boundaries. Because it is not a pretty life to always be in search of a happy face, and it is not for your own good. For God's sakes, remember when your father, my father used to spank me, and the first thing he would tell me is the same thing they'd tell me at school. I'm going to do this for your own good. And I always wanted to say, well, damn it, why don't you spank yourself then? Because you can spare me the favor. If it's for good, do it to you. I love you, Dad. And if it's for good, do it to yourself because we want you to have the good. Don't do it for my own good. Don't do me any favors here. 
Oh, well, we don't think you'll work out w with our firm. It's for your own good. Oh, well, thanks anyway. But I'll sacrifice for you. <laughs> you know, uh, modern power presents itself as what I would like to call, and I, and I mean this especially where it's least obvious. We know what modern power has looked like in the East Bloc and in the Soviet Union, and it was no surprise to anyone they were totalitarians. What I would like for us to recognize is that we are totalitarians as well. It's a horrible, but till we see it, we won't have a chance to be really radically democratic ever. I mean, I mean, okay, a little biblical scholarship here. Easy to find the moat in your brother's eye, difficult to see the one in your own, very difficult. So this account of power reminds us that the totalitarian is not the other. Sometimes we meet the enemy and it's us. 